On this week's edition of Crypto Trader, we bring you two titans of industry that have been bantering on social media for a while. They've been tweeting at each other non-stop for months now, one shilling Bitcoin and the other one punting gold. It's been dubbed the golden debate. On my left, we have a man that certainly needs no introduction in the crypto game. He's the founder of Morgan Creek Digital, hosts the wildly successful Off The Chain podcasts. He's a disruptor, an investor, and he's well known for, quote, spreading the virus. He's, of course, Anthony Pompliano. On my right, the chief economist and global strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, a gold bug, well known for warning the world about the financial crisis in 2008. He's a best-selling author, hosts his own podcast, he's an advocate for emerging markets, and is, of course, a global critic against Bitcoin and crypto. With Bitcoin trading at under $10,000 and having tripled so far this year, will Anthony Pompliano convince Peter Schiff that Bitcoin is the new gold? Will Peter Schiff be able to convince Anthony Pompliano to change his views and look back to the 3,000-year-old precious metal that's up nearly 40 times since the US moved off the gold standard post-World War II? All this and more on tonight's edition of Crypto Trader. You don't want to miss this, so stay tuned. Gentlemen, let's set the scene for a great, clean debate. I'm going to set the ground rules here. Let's agree to be here with an open mind and present factual arguments only. I'm going to moderate and keep us on time so we can pay the bills and play the ads. Let's make sure we play the ball and not the man. We're here to have fun, we're here to learn, and we're here to exchange views. So I'm going to set the context, and then I'm going to hand it over to you guys for two-minute opening statements. So for context, and you've been labeled a Bitcoin shield by the critics. And uh, the critics are not the normal skeptics. In fact, we've had President Trump, we've had the Senate, we've had the White House, all critiquing Bitcoin or becoming Bitcoin skeptics. Peter, you're getting excited about one and 2% moves in the price of gold, a commodity that's 3,000 years old, hard to transport, virtually impossible to physically own, and hasn't been the best investment. With that in mind, I want you guys to take it away with two minute opening statements. Anthony, it's over to you. For sure. Um, you know, look, I'm excited to do this. Uh, Peter and I actually have been having a lot of fun on the internet, but um, we, we, I think, see eye to eye on a lot of the global macro issues that uh, the world's facing today. Um, if you look at the uh, recessive period that we're most likely to go into, um, has alarms going off uh, from the inverse um, or inverted yield curves. And uh, it, when that happens, central banks basically have two tools at their disposal. They can either cut interest rates or they can print money. And when that happens, um, good, sustainable uh, stores of value should benefit. Um, gold has served that purpose for uh, you know thousands of years. Um, and I think that you're seeing when we broke off the gold standard uh, and the ability for um, the central banks to actually debase the currency, you saw gold rise over 40x. Um, I'm not here to uh, you know, kind of argue against gold necessarily. I actually think gold uh, has a place in people's portfolio, but I do think that um, it's a little short-sighted to say gold but not Bitcoin. Um, I think that Bitcoin has a number of advantages in places that gold doesn't, um, and I think that Bitcoin has a, a role to play in people's portfolio. And so uh, by the end of this, hopefully Peter will be saying gold and Bitcoin rather than uh, gold not Bitcoin. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully by the yeah. end of this, indeed, yeah. Peter will be saying that. Peter, over to you for your two-minute yeah. opening statement to set the yeah. tone for the debate. Yeah, and first of all, if you're going to refer to me as a gold bug, we're going to have to call Anthony a Bitcoin bug. <laughs> and that is actually is a better ring to it anyway, right? Bitcoin, Bitcoin bug. bug, gold bug. All right, yeah. Peter, That's two good. minutes, over to you. And look, I have a lot of sympathy with uh, the Bitcoin bugs. You know, and their you know, skepticism or their concerns about our fiat monetary system and the problems that it has. But, you know, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, you know, there already is a monetary alternative to fiat, and that is gold. And, you know, what the creator of Bitcoin tried to do and other cryptos is they're, they're replicating a lot of the qualities that enabled gold to be a better form of money than other commodities that were also used as money. But the one key property that Bitcoin can't replicate is the properties that made gold a valuable commodity. Because before gold was money, it was a commodity. It was a very rare and highly desirable luxury good that has all sorts of uses. And it's those 
fundamental uses that give it its value. It's, it's other properties that make it serve as money. And the reason it's a store of value is because the properties of gold don't decay over time. So whatever you can use gold for today, whether it's jewelry or aerospace or consumer electronics, if I store my gold for 100 years or 1,000 years, I can still use the gold for those purposes. Nothing will have changed over time. But the problem with Bitcoin and the idea that it can be a store of value is it has no value to store. There is nothing that you can use Bitcoin for. The value for Bitcoin is completely a function of the confidence that people have that they'll be able to give it to somebody else in the future at a higher price. All right, Peter, that's your two minutes up. And <laughs> Peter has been quite vocal about this and he's tweeted a few times saying, you know, that. If for Bitcoin to have any value, it means that we've got to almost sucker somebody else into buying it. Is that what you've been saying? You've been saying that Bitcoin only has value if the people that have bought in early can actually get someone to buy it off them. Well, most of the people that I know, and I know a lot of people that own Bitcoin, I mean, they have pie in the sky delusions about how high the price is going to go. And the main motivation is uh, for the price to go up. They don't use it. They don't transact in it. They just hodl it. And, and, and they're hoping they get rich. And what's your response to that? People not using Bitcoin and just huddling it and hoping to get rich? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of different things, right? The first is um, the transaction network, right? So we have to separate out there's big B Bitcoin and little B Bitcoin, right? The little B Bitcoin is the asset that you can hold and the big B Bitcoin is the network that you can transact on. Mm -hmm. That network or the on-chain settlement of transactions did over $410 billion of transactions last year, 2018. That's more volume than Venmo did, than Apple Pay or PayPal, right? So there's but people what are using these transactions? transactions. Is this just people buying and selling amongst each other, or is this people actually using Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee? Well, well it, it's obviously everything, right? So it's all, that incorpor uh, incorporates everything. So but how much of it is just you know people buying and selling it uh, to each other? And of course. Some people can have multiple wallets and they could just be buying with their left hand and selling with their right hand, right? You don't know how much of the volume is legitimate two-party transactions that are arm's length mm -hmm. and how much of it is just, you know, people spoofing and, you know, uh, just creating volume for the sake of uh, creating the, the illusion that something's going on. For sure, but I, I think the idea that they're doing that for $410 billion of annual volume when some of those other platforms only do, you know, they, they do less than $100 billion, right? It's really hard to fake 410 on-chain transactions in terms of, we know for sure the transactions are real because they're on-chain, so we can verify them, uh, which is one of the benefits of Bitcoin, but also $410 billion is a lot to go ahead and, and move like that if it was all fake, right? So I think that's one piece of it. And the second piece is, you know, gold is not used to buy coffee. Gold's not used to do certain things with that. You know, people say, well, Bitcoin can't do this. I think that one of gold's main use cases is a store of value, right? You buy it, you hold it, and what you're hoping for is that the value that you placed into it or your wealth that you placed into gold is the same or higher in the future, right? So that's the value of a store of value um, asset. Now. Bitcoin, the hodlers, right, or the, the people who hold Bitcoin for long periods of time, they're using it as a store of value. So it has the exact same use case as gold, and what they're doing is they're taking their wealth, they're putting it into this asset. It doesn't have many of the physical properties that gold has, but it has something that gold doesn't in the cryptographic security, and they're trusting that that cryptographic security is, uh, that feature is more important to them than the physical aspects, and that's what goes ahead and uh, stores that value over a long period of time. Gentlemen, before we continue, can we agree are you saying that Bitcoin is a digital gold and a digital store of value? Yeah, so one of the things that's really important to understand is if you think of the fiat world, so forget about Bitcoin and digital assets for a second. In the fiat world, we started with gold. Gold was the commodity, right? And that was what was used as a store of value and a medium of exchange. Gold, for a bunch of reasons that you know Peter and others uh, have highlighted, it's not easy to take that gold and go buy coffee at Starbucks, right? So what did we do? We created paper claims on the gold. We created dollar bills that um, ended up saying, I own this much gold, I'll trade you the paper rather than the bar of gold, right? On top of that, we then built the electronic financial system and eventually credit, et cetera. So if you think of gold as the layer one technology, right? Paper's layer two, layer three all the way up. What we're seeing in the digital world is the exact same thing but it's gonna take a really long time. So Bitcoin itself today is just simply serving as a layer one technology. It's the equivalent of gold in that it doesn't need to be super scalable for transactions at coffee, et cetera. There will be these other layers that eventually get built on top of it. The question is who's gonna build it? When is it gonna come? How does it work, et cetera? Yeah, well, first of all, when 
gold was money, and gold was money before we had fiat. Mm -hmm. When people wanted to buy something small, like a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. they didn't pay for it with gold. Mm -hmm. They would use another metal that was yep. money. They might use copper. Right? Mm -hmm. Pennies were made out of copper or nickel. And so you could use other forms of money because other commodities can serve as money mm -hmm. uh, in addition to gold. In fact, in the United States, legally, we have a bimetallic system where both gold and silver were money. Mm -hmm. right? uh, copper and nickel were used as medium of exchange. They weren't legal tender, but people still bought things with pennies and with nickels. But yes, uh, for some transactions, banks would store your gold and then they would issue a, a currency backed by that gold, and then people would start exchanging uh, the paper mm -hmm. uh, instead of the actual gold. The, mm -hmm. the gold ownership would stay at a blacksmith or a bank, but what gave gold its value, or even copper or nickel or silver, is the things that you can do with those metals apart from use them uh, as a medium of exchange or store of value. And the value that you are storing is all of the things that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. But with Bitcoin, there's nothing that you can do with it, so you're not storing any value. And to say that, well, people aren't using gold to buy a cup of coffee, they're not using gold now mm -hmm. uh, as a medium of exchange because everybody is using paper. Mm -hmm. But if uh, a coffee merchant wanted to be paid in gold mm -hmm. and a customer wanted to pay in gold, that's actually easy to do. I can do that easier than, than doing it with Bitcoin. It's a less expensive transaction, it happens faster and it happens quicker. So, you know, using the technology, people in Bitcoin want to keep saying, hey, Peter, you don't look at technology. Well, with the technology that exists today, it's very easy to have your gold stored and then electronically transfer ownership of whatever quantity you want between two people. Mm -hmm. And so people can use gold as a medium of exchange, and they will use it again once confidence is really lost in the fiat system, and you start to see a more rapid decline in the purchasing power of the dollar or the euro or the yen, mm -hmm. uh, then you'll see the public demanding a more stable alternative, and they'll go back to gold. Peter, why do you think that people today don't use gold as a medium of exchange? Well, because they, why would they? I mean, they're, they're getting paid their salaries in, if they live in the U.S., they're getting paid in dollars. Uh, and their landlord wants to be paid rent in dollars. The U.S. government wants taxes in dollars. All the prices are in dollars. So it's a lot easier for people to use dollars. And, you know, dollars, they're not a great long-term store of value. In fact, they're a lousy long-term store of value. But on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis, they're pretty stable. And it's very easy to transact in them. And why do you think people today aren't using gold as a, as, a, as a value transfer mechanism or a payment mechanism? Well, it's the same reason why things like paper claims on gold, et cetera, were created, right? It, it's very difficult to use. It's that layer one technology. And I think when you look at Bitcoin, it's very similar, right? I, I agree with Peter that there's not a ton of transaction volume where people are going to a coffee shop and buying coffee, but I don't think that's what Bitcoin is necessarily intended to do at this moment, right? Because we need to build more and more infrastructure. We're comparing an asset like gold that has three thousand plus years of existence as a store of value medium of exchange to an asset that is 10 and a half years old, right? And, and the other piece I would say is from a store of value, I re really want to kind of focus in on store of value for a second because I think that's, um, there's very few people who would argue that gold is not a store of value, right? So I think we can all agree gold is a store of value. Um, and the way that you measure that store of value, right, whether it's going up or down in, in, um, in the ability to store value is the U.S. dollar price, right? So we say I could take X percentage of gold and I can go ahead and I can turn it into dollars. Here's how much dollars I would get for that gold. Bitcoin has the same thing, right? There's one Bitcoin. What is the U.S. dollar exchange price, right? That's how we measure store value for both assets. And gold has actually, since 1971, right, when we broke from the gold standard, done very well. It's 40x, right? There's not a lot of other assets that have done that well over that period of time. Now, Bitcoin has done that in the last two years, right? Two and a half years. And so, when, when you look at that, what ends up occurring is you're seeing the same symptoms or the same um, kind of mechanisms of gold and, and where value accrued and how it grew and why it grew and, and how it permeated society. You're seeing it in another store of value asset. The difference is gold doesn't get the benefit of the internet, right? The internet gives something much more scalability, can go viral. And, and I think that the other key piece is money is just a belief system. Right, so a medium of exchange is simply valuable because both parties agree. Right, so I think when Peter said, "Not real money," you're talking about fiat money. You're talking about a paper currency that governments create out of thin air. There, the value is derived from faith and confidence, but it also has the backing of the government that issued it 
and the fact that each government demands that its citizens pay taxes in that currency that it creates, which means there is a demand among the citizens to accumulate that currency in order to pay those taxes. And because of that, all of the contracts are denominated in that, uh, employment contracts, rental agreements, uh, bonds, insurance contracts. So everybody starts using it. But ultimately, if the government abuses uh, the, the, the privilege of creating it and it creates too much, uh, it collapses in value because the confidence is, is destroyed. And, and Bitcoin has much more in common with a fiat currency than it does with gold because gold's value is derived from its physical properties that make it desirable and make it useful whereas Bitcoin's value is derived from the confidence that people are going to want it in the future, even though it has no physical properties or any other properties that you could use it for. After the commercial break, we'll talk about the properties of gold and the properties of Bitcoin. So stay tuned. And we're back with the golden debate. So far less heated than I expected, but we're only a few minutes in. Just before the break, Peter Schiff highlighted the properties that Bitcoin has and the properties that gold has. And you were going to respond. Let's talk about the properties of gold versus the properties of Bitcoin. Yeah, I want to make sure we understand uh, a medium of exchange, right? Gold has certain physical properties, right? And I don't think anyone debates whether they have those properties or not. The question is, are they valuable, right? And that's what actually, when I say that uh, money is a belief system, whether Peter wants to pay me in gold, in rocks, in dollars, or in something else, the only way that that is actually going to consummate a transaction is if both he and I believe that that asset has value. Right? I want the asset, he wants to give me the assets. We both have to buy into the belief that that is valuable. But if Peter has gold and I don't want gold, or I don't think gold is valuable, it doesn't matter what the US dollar price is, I'm not gonna accept it, so therefore it is worthless in this transaction. By the way, the same thing is true of Bitcoin, right? If one side of the transaction doesn't want Bitcoin, then the Bitcoin in that transaction is worthless, right? You can't use well, it. That, does, that doesn't matter if you don't want it. I mean, even the GIs uh, after World War II were using cigarettes as money. Yep. Even if you didn't smoke, you still knew that other people did. And so if you didn't want to smoke the cigarettes, you knew that there was a market of smokers and you would still accept cigarettes but you believed in exchange. Value. You but believed it was not it was about valuable. belief. You know that people smoked them. Right, so gold has value. There's an entire jewelry industry uh, that is built around gold. People want gold in jewelry, but they use it in dentistry, they use it in uh, con consumer electronics, cell phones have gold in them. So we know that there is industrial, there is jewelry, and there is monetary demand. Central banks are big owners of gold, they are buyers of gold, so you know it's there as a reserve asset. So it's not a question of whether or not you think gold has value. It objectively has value because of all the things it is being used for today and all the things it's been used for for thousands of years. So Peter, what is gold used for other than a store of value today? What percent? I just told you, half the gold is used in jewelry. Look, I'm wearing a watch. There's gold in, in, in this watch, right? There, it's a great you know, watch. Yeah, I mean, so you, people need gold to do that. And you know, you talk about how it's so clunky and cumbersome. You know, I happen to have 50 grams of gold that I had in my wallet. This is the size of a credit card. In fact, it, it's a debit card, but it's made of gold. It doesn't weigh very much. Here, it's $1,500 at present melt value. Don't, hey, don't, don't put that. But it's very easy for people to carry around physical gold, but this particular debit card links to a, an account that I have. Uh, you said you don't use gold on the internet. I have an account in gold money, and I have gold in the account, and if I want to spend the gold, if somebody wants it, I can transfer ownership of my gold for free to a merchant, or I can uh, you know, use this and I can you know, go to an uh, ATM machine and liquidate some of my gold and take out the cash, or I can it. buy something with it. Uh, but but you the, know. Key, the key difference here is, um, so there's two things. One is the gold in that account, right? So you put gold, uh, gold in the gold money account, you, right. have, you have this card. When you want to transfer it to, say, Ron, right, the only way he can receive that gold is he gets an account at gold money. If he, wa if he directly wants the gold, absolutely. He okay. has to go online, yep. open up a gold money account, and yep. if we both have accounts, we can transfer ownership and gold from money, one another. Gold money takes the gold from your account, right? It debits it and it credits it to Ryan's Right, it account. doesn't actually move the gold. The gold stays in a vault, it's right. a Brinks vault, whether it's in Switzerland or Dubai yep. or Hong Kong, and the ownership transfers from me to the counterparty. How do, you, how do you know in that system that gold money is actually doing what you tell them to do? Well, I mean, they're, A, they, they're saying that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, they're 
company. They're, they have competitive forces. Uh, you know, they're, they're storing with Brinks, which is a third party. Mm -hmm. uh, Brinks has been custodian gold for 150 years, hasn't lost any. They have reinsurance through Lloyd's of London. So you have a lot of free market safeguards that say the company is doing what they're saying they're doing. If they're not doing it, they're liable. There's fraud there. But they have auditors. They have all sorts of safeguards. Can, can you go in and audit or, or verify that the gold's there, that they're actually moving it to other accounts? Like, like how do you Well, do I mean, that? if I physically wanted to do it myself, I'm sure that I could, but I can accept the opinion of third-party auditors uh, that have a reputation in the market that they need to maintain. But again, look, you know, gold money is not the only company that can do this. I mean, people in the crypto community keep saying, you can't trust third parties. Of course you trust third parties. That's what capitalism is all about. Those third parties are competing with each other for reputation in the marketplace. And they're not gonna blow that reputation if they wanna preserve its value. I mean, where, where I see a complete leap of faith and trust is people who wanna put their trust in, in Bitcoin, something that doesn't even really exist, and you're gonna, you're gonna have trust in that, that it's gonna maintain some value. You have to trust this network, you have to trust miners who you've never met, you have to trust all these whales and you have no idea well, what their hidden agendas are. All, Antti, you're, Antti. all you're trusting is you're trusting a piece of software, right? You're trusting an algorithm. No, no, I'm not even trusting that. I'm trusting that this digital creation Mm -hmm. out of nothing, this string of numbers, mm -hmm. right? Letters or numbers, software. right? No, it's not the software. I don't get the software. I just get the string of numbers that somehow somebody in the future is actually going to want that mm -hmm. and be willing to pay me money for that. Well, I mean, well, that's well, what you're trusting. Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about trust for a second. Peter, you're talking about trust and you're talking about trust of third party service providers. And we know from history that whereas this is a capitalistic society and that there has been, uh, there have been some breaches of trust by even the most mm -hmm. reputable service providers. And let's talk about the trust in the Bitcoin network and yeah. how it actually works. Yeah, so, so what I, what I was getting at with the questions is you're trusting a third party, right? And, and there's well, that, a I, Again, that's for the part of my gold that I keep with gold money. Yep. I have gold in my safe. I mean, this, this gold that's in my pocket, I'm not trusting anybody. Yep. I have it on me. It's in my possession. Yep. And, a lot, and most people keep most of their gold in their own safes. Yep. And they're not trusting a third party because they own the gold themselves. Yep. So what you have to remember with Bitcoin is the exact same mechanisms exist, right? So I can take my Bitcoin, which again is just software, right? It, it, it is governed by an algorithm, but it's just software. And I can put it with a third party custody yeah, provider, I get that. right? Or I can, it can be non-custodial. I can hold on to it myself, right? But the key switch here, I think, is that you trust that piece of metal, right? Because you can physically hold it, you have it, you, you understand what the physical properties are, and you think that you're going to be able to give it to somebody else in the future, right? And it's going to be, they're going to pay you for it, right? If you want to give it to them. Well, the goals had value for thousands of years, there's no reason for it to stop having value. Um, but what you're doing is you're trusting that something that's only had market value for a decade, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have value outside that market, mm -hmm. right? And you're just, you're just having confidence that people are gonna want it. And again, what makes no sense is even if you assume, okay, if cryptocurrencies are going to work, mm -hmm. I cannot think of an example throughout history where any innovation, where the first one was the best one, Right, wherever it was invented, whether somebody invented the telephone, the first telephone was not the best telephone. It's been improved upon. The first Before. television, the first automobile. So if cryptocurrency would work, why would we assume that Bitcoin is the one that's gonna succeed? Why would the first attempt be the best attempt? Why wouldn't somebody come up with something better, that's quicker, that's more reliable, that's more secure than Bitcoin? And if somebody can do that, then it renders Bitcoin worthless because so, there's something better. Before we continue in that debate, and the debate there is whether the first is the best and the one that's gonna survive, let's put the trust issues to bed because I don't think we've fully put the trust issues away. You're saying that your trust third-party providers holding gold, or you trust the gold that's in your safe at home, um, which can be stolen, which, uh, which, which can't be stored in very big amounts. You're saying you trust the computer algorithm. I want to get to some kind of finality where the two of you agree well, as to well, whether- gold, See, gold is not about trust. I don't have to trust when I own gold, right? You have to trust when you own fiat currency. You have to trust when you own Bitcoin. But the, the value of gold is based on the underlying uses the utility of the metal itself, right? So which you don't have to jewelry, trust that- Which is jewelry? That's a big part of it. And don't, and don't downplay how important jewelry is, 
Right? I, mean, I have a wife. So yes, and you. Know, <laughs> I mean, and and you know, and jewelry is also you know, it's important in culture, it's important in religion, and, and there's a reason that gold is used for jewelry. It's not an accident that people choose but to you, make jewelry out of gold. You trust algorithms and software with other parts of your life, right? So when you get lost in New York City, you don't ask the guy on the street corner for directions. You pull up Google Maps and say, "Tell me where to go." But that's right? a different type of trust. Well, hold on, but but you trust that that software is going to do its job, right? When you want a music recommendation, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever you use, right? They recommend music and you trust that it, it's accurate. If you want answers to a question, you trust Google to give you the answers, right? So, so there's other aspects in your non-financial life that you trust algorithms Right, but and again, I don't think I'm gonna turn around and sell my GPS at a profit to somebody else in the future. No. I, don't, I don't confuse it with being a store of value because it provides some type of service that I, that I paid for, that I purchased. When you buy Bitcoin, it's not providing any service. It's not satisfying any of your uh, uh, you know, well, needs or desires. It's, it's providing it's, cryptographic security. But security of what? You've secured nothing. Yes, I mean, I can even concede potentially that Bitcoin, you can't, if I own a Bitcoin, no one's going to steal it. But if I have nothing, then what difference does it make whether someone steals it or not? I mean, it only has this value to the extent that somebody else believes they're going to get rich by buying it. And again, you know, you don't want to confuse because you said earlier that uh, uh, store of value. I will concede that the price of Bitcoin has gone way up, but you can't con you confuse price appreciation with a store of value. Anything that can go up can also come way down, as we've seen before. I mean, Bitcoin has had some spectacular declines, uh, and so there's a lot of volatility there. But, but it's, you don't it's know- growing, It's growing just like a network grows, right? So if you think of a, a, take a mobile application, right? The way that networks grow is there's an influx of new users, right? So everyone rushes in, they wanna try the new hot mobile app. Then there's some churn of those users. So let's say that 100 new people come in to try something, right? You try it, you don't like it, he likes it. 30% of those people leave, right? So it's a net 70% gain, right? Or net 70 people gain for that network. Then there's another big rush of people, right? When those new people come in, some of them churn out, but there's another net gain. And so the low continues to be higher but what happens because you're when getting you, when higher you get and higher the, retention. What happens when you get the final rush? What happens when you've, you've reached your max and now p more people are losing interest in Bitcoin than trying to adopt it, right? You've, you've maxed out. Uh, the appeal of the network, and now instead of continuing to grow, it starts to shrink. Well, then what happens? Re remember that money in general is a very viral product, right? So if I give you money, and then you turn around and you use it, and then somebody else uses it, somebody else uses it, you're pulling more people into the network, right? And network effects, right, we know from technology companies, network effects are really, really hard to unbundle. Right, so if all of us are all using something, right? Take Google for example. There's so many people putting content up, trying to get it listed on Google. There's so many people who are going and searching all the time, right? So that traffic and the content providers, there's a network there to get you to switch from whether it's an Uber as a network uh, effect business, uh, Google from a uh, information network effect business, etc. To get you to switch is really, really hard to do, right? Because once the network starts to grow, there's lock-in. And so when you get that with money, right, what you're getting is you're getting millions of people. Right? Here's people the aren't using question. people aren't using Bitcoin as holding, money. Holding, they're holding they're buying it case. and they're hoping but, but it goes up. Holding is a use case, right? Not with really. Gold. You're well, just, with gold, you're, people are holding, hoping that the price goes up so they can sell. But aren't so they, they can actually buy something? But with isn't it. that what you're doing with gold when no. you hold it as a store of value? No. What are you doing? Not doing that at all. I mean, first of all, because we know that over time there's always going to be demand for gold. For Maybe. all of its well, various per well, uses. How do we know this? Well, it's been there's, it's for thousands of years. Why would it stop? I mean, there, if people could invent something better than gold, they might have already done it, right? So they haven't. But you know, uh, you know, you could try to pick some other commodity that you think is a store of value, but they don't have the properties that gold has that make it uh, that you know likely to store that value. But Bitcoin doesn't have any of them. People aren't just holding gold to speculate because I don't have to find another gold speculator to buy my gold because I can, a jeweler can buy it, or a dentist can buy it, or a, 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 a computer chip manufacturing company can buy but it. But isn't the jeweler just a gold speculator as well? Because no. what they're doing is they're saying, I'm gonna buy the gold for $1,000, and I'm going to manipulate it, I'm gonna do something to it, and I'm gonna put it into another form factor 
and I'm speculating that in that new form factor, I'm going to be able to sell it for more money than No, it's not a speculation. You know the demand in your industry. You know that, you know... But just because you know the demand doesn't mean that it's not speculation. No, it's... Look, I mean, you can make that argument about any single commodity. You, how course. do you know people are going to want milk? How do you know people are going to want wheat? How do you know they're going to want oil? I mean, you know... Of but, course. But there's nothing that you could do... With Bitcoin, all of the demand for Bitcoin is somebody is going to want to buy it because they think somebody else will pay a higher price for it. And it's all about the greater fool. Everybody who's in Bitcoin ultimately needs to sell it because anything that you want to buy, any product that you want to buy, the seller is not accepting Bitcoin. You have to sell the Bitcoin. If you want to buy a car, if you want to buy your Lambo, right, you got to take your Bitcoin and convert it to dollars or euros, depending on where you're buying that car. And now those Bitcoins have to be sold. So you have to have a new buyer for the existing people to get out. And from my perspective, having just looked at Bitcoin, I don't think the hype or the excitement today is as great as it was a year, year and a half ago. And I think if you look at the number of stores- But why, but why is that the are, price higher? Hmm? Why, well, if, the price isn't higher. The price got to 20,000 and now it's barely 10,000. Uh, I think the price is declining. I think the market peaked uh, at that 20,000 level in December of 2017. I think interest kind of peaked uh, as well. And I think once the market really dropped, uh, people now had a, you know, a more uh, balanced view because before that, it had only gone up as far as anybody knew. It was like a straight ride up and everybody was making money. So but now people have lost money in Bitcoin. So I would say more people who own Bitcoin are losing money than making money. Okay, so you think that Bitcoin has gone to the high? After the break, we'll let you respond. We're going to cross over for a commercial break. Things certainly getting heated up here. Don't miss the next part of the debate. Stay tuned. And welcome back to what's been dubbed the golden debate. Things certainly are getting heated around here. Just before the break, Peter Schiff took a swipe at Bitcoin, saying that the price will never see the all-time high again. And how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, the, the best part, I think, is Bitcoin is the best performing asset over the last decade. Um, and part of being a great performing asset is price, right, which I think is easy for people to track. Um, but the other aspects of Bitcoin that are uh, very valuable to people who think of it from a portfolio construction standpoint, uh, very similar to I think how Peter thinks about gold, is there's a non-correlation. Right. So in, um, in different periods of time, uh, there's even been inverse correlations to other assets. Uh, but over a long period of time now, we've had very low or no correlation to S&P, gold, etc. And so when you get that, what ends up happening is by introducing a non-correlated asset that has this asymmetric upside to it, it has a lot of the same properties that gold has, right? Why would you put gold into a portfolio, right? Ray Dalio just recently came out and said, look, again, going back to the central bank issue, recessive periods are coming. They're going to cut rates. They're going to print money great time to own gold, right? Because it has a non-correlation, it's got the store of value, uh, property, et cetera. Well, Bitcoin is exactly like gold in the sense that it is non-correlated, it's got a store of value property, but the difference is that Bitcoin's upside is 50, 100 plus X on the, on the upside, whereas when you look at um, gold, gold may have, you know, I think Peter said $5,000, right? So today from a $1,500, $1,400 price point to 5,000 would still be a big move, but we're talking about three, four X, right? So three, four X versus, you know, call it 10 X, 50 X, 100 X, whatever that number is, um, the upside versus the risk you're taking is very, very different. Well, you now could, you're, you're you, being compensated yeah, for the risk yeah. because gold has 3000 years of history, right? So, so it's less risk in terms of putting your assets there as a store of value. So you get compensated for the risk you take. Yeah, but Peter, before you answer, and I, I wanna ask you a question. What do you believe are the benefits of Bitcoin to gold? Where does Bitcoin trump gold? Let's listen. Yeah, yeah so, so it, a lot of it comes around um, three separate things, right? Um, and I'm talking about Bitcoin, little b, the asset, right? Not, not even going to the transaction network. But uh, the cryptographic security obviously is a huge piece. Um, the divisibility of it is a huge piece. Uh, the portability, so the ability for me to move what, uh, it is a huge piece. Um, and ultimately, uh, when you put those things together, what you get is an asset that cannot be seized. It cannot be censored, right? And so when you have a non-seizable, non-censorable uh, asset that is portable, divisible, and secure, you have something that is very, very valuable to some portion of the population on Earth. Now, the reason why it's important that I say some portion of the population is because it's not hundreds of millions of people, it's not billions of people today, right? It's a small number, right, in the grand scheme of things. But you have a fixed supply asset, and so as demand increases, more and more people realize, oh, this is what Bitcoin is. This actually has value, I want that. What 
occurs is you get the US dollar price has to go up because of supply and demand economics. Increases in demand for a fixed supply asset has to increase the price. Yeah, well, so many things there. I mean, first of all, there may be a fixed supply of Bitcoin, but there's not a fixed supply of alternative cryptocurrencies that may sure. or may not be uh, preferable to Bitcoin. But so there's Peter, there's no the, limit to the number that can Peter, be created. For the purposes of this debate, and because we're limited in time, let's keep a discussion around Bitcoin. Right, but you and can't gold. ignore the fact that. Bit, the properties that Bitcoin has are not unique to any other cryptocurrency that but could be created. But could you say the same about gold no, and silver you can't and say copper that because and silver, platinum no, and titanium? And because silver has different properties than gold so and, does, and so does, does copper. Not really, not really. You, you just We want to pretend that they do. But since, practically speaking, they don't really have different uses because they have no uses other than as a medium of exchange, there is an infinite supply of these cryptos, but to say so that does crypto have a use case as a medium of, of exchange? But that, that that doesn't count as the use case, oh, right? Okay. And the thing is, it's not a good medium of exchange because it's very volatile and it's expensive to transact in. At least Bitcoin is, right? But when you go back to a portfolio and say, "Hey, I'm going to put Bitcoin in a portfolio because it's got all this upside," well, you might as well put lottery tickets into your portfolio. I mean, you can hit the winning lottery ticket and it could go up, you know, a thousand times. Right? I could buy a two dollar lottery ticket and win a hundred million dollars. But, but what's the the odds? What's the probability of that actually happening? It's a long shot. The idea that Bitcoin is going to go up 100x is a long shot. I mean, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, and when I say I don't think it's going to break a new high, it doesn't mean that it can't. But if I was going to say what are the probabilities, I think there's probably a better probability that the high is in than not. But there's a realistic probability that Bitcoin will make a new high. But I don't think that the upside in Bitcoin from here is enough to compensate for the downside. The ultimate downside is it zeroes out, mm -hmm. right? But uh, so you lose all your money. Well, if you wanna make a bet where you may lose all your money, I can think of a lot of other gambles that will probably give you a better risk reward uh, than, than Bitcoin. And again, when I look at gold too as an asset, I mean, it's, it's a commodity. It's not an asset like stocks, because it doesn't pay a dividend. Yep. It's not a bond because it doesn't pay interest. It's not real estate because it doesn't collect rent. So gold, when you think about it in a portfolio, it is an alternative to holding cash reserves. So if you think stocks are expensive or bonds are expensive and you want dry powder, but you're also worried about inflation and a weakening currency market, you'll keep that dry powder stored in gold. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. But to say I'm gonna keep my dry powder in Bitcoin makes no sense whatsoever. Because when stocks go down and bonds go down, it's possible that Bitcoin can go down even more. So but, Peter, but the Anthony, before you answer- suggests that in those times of global instability, Bitcoin becomes inversely correlated to, to what? To the S&P. So in May, in May of this year, when the trade wars were raging on, the president was tweeting all about, you know, China and Mexico and India and, and Iran, etc. There were, there was increases in global instability, right? Bitcoin during that month was up 55% and the correlation from Bitcoin to the S&P was negative 0.9. So it was inversely correlated. But that could be stocks. just as well, well coincidence but because could, there, are plenty, be. there are plenty of periods of time where the S&P has gone down and Bitcoin's gone down at the same time. But, but also Bitcoin was inversely correlated to gold. It had a negative 0.8 correlation to gold. So if gold goes down, Bitcoin goes up, right? Sometimes. And, sometimes big gold again, goes up and Bitcoin goes up. You have no well, idea. Well, but and, and and with respect, we are talking about a very small period of time here. You're Absolutely. talking about a, that your, your, your sample uh, size in terms of time is, is a very small period of time. And to I'm fall back on that kind of argument. Just because stocks go down doesn't mean Bitcoin has to go down, right? There's, there's plenty of examples where that's not true. But my, my point is that Bitcoin very similar to gold, but Bitcoin specifically is a non-correlated asset, right? So sometimes it goes up with it, sometimes it goes down, sometimes there's no uh, correlation whatsoever, but it is a non-correlated asset over a long period of time. It is also not only a non-correlated asset, it is the best performing asset for the last decade, right? When you think of a decade, right, th th that's not, a year, not a month, a week, right? Talk about a decade. No, it's actually not. Asset. I'm sure there's, there could be a winning lottery ticket that performed better than Bitcoin. Uh, but, you know, Bitcoin's <laughs> only been around for a short period of time, but it's one of the worst performing assets since December of 2017. So, you know, you, yes, when Bitcoin first got started and it was pennies of Bitcoin, before it bubbled up the way it did, sure, 
It was a great performing asset, just like tulip bulbs were a great performing asset, you know, before but the bubble the popped. Or, fairness, or, you know, Beanie Babies or any kind of things that... In the interest of fairness, I think let's look at both assets over a certain period of time. And we can look at it either over 10 years or over the last five years. And I think there's been no doubt that over 10 years or the last five years, Bitcoin has been a better performer. Well, there's no, there's no doubt that it's been fantastic for the people who got in early and who are selling, right? I mean, they've made a lot of money. Right? It was a great trade. But just because something was the best performing asset over the last 10 years doesn't mean it's going to be the best performing asset over the next 10. In fact, it could end up being the worst performing asset over the next 10 as the people try to cash in on all those gains that they made on the run-up. That, that, that's completely fair. The past performance does not indicate future performance. Right? I think we agree on that. I think that when we look at this, my argument is not gold is bad. Right? I actually think that gold, for many of the same reasons why you believe gold has value, gold has value. Right? The physical properties, non-correlation, right? store of value, et cetera. What I'm hoping that you can get to is to say gold is the incumbent. Right? It's been around for 3,000 years. We know it works. There's some challenges, right? It's hard to move a lot of it. Not really. Well, I mean, if I said, do you send me $50 million worth of gold, how long would that take? Well, if you actually wanted the physical gold in your safe, yeah. right? You know, I have, have to have a company it could take a few days to get it over there. Yeah, and ship so it a over. A few days and, and a couple of airplanes and well, ships. <laughs> well, and, and, but, but with gold's Bitcoin, not that heavy. But, but I mean, for, for that for that much dollar value. Yeah, but, remember, all the gold in the world that's ever been mined would fit in a swimming pool. So you're not talking about if I'm going to send somebody fifty million dollars worth of gold. You know, it's a lot of money, but it's really not a lot of volume. But but you have to remember, right? As if you were the most efficient mover of gold in the world, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is still more efficient to move. Right? right, but the difference is when you're moving gold, you're moving something. When you're moving Bitcoin, you're moving nothing. Obviously, would, would, to move you, nothing doesn't take a lot of effort. So forget about Bitcoin for a second. Would you argue that digital assets in general have no value, that, that, there's, that there's nothing there? But when you mean a digital asset, if you mean the 2,000 whatever cryptocurrencies, I don't think they have any value. Okay. So what do you mean like, when you talk about a yeah. digital asset? So, so let's take a song, for example. A song is a computer file, right? Well, a so song has value because I can listen to it and I can asset. dance to it. No, but the thing is, it's, it serves a purpose, right? It's entertainment, right? So my being entertained is a value to me. If I can play music and it makes me feel good, if I sing along with it, if I can dance to it, if it sets the mood, if I want to have a party or want to have a romantic dinner, so saying, music is a part of that. So it's satisfying that. Bitcoin doesn't do any of that. So I don't have saying, a romantic dinner and, pl and, and, and put my Bitcoin on. But you could spend Bitcoin to buy a romantic dinner at more, Only places, to, at no. more places than you could gold? No, no you can't. What, how many do you think in the world there's more people who accept Bitcoin as merchants or people no, who they accept don't, gold? No, nobody really accepts. There may be a few like Bitcoin fanatics that want it, in which case it's really like what about barter. Starbucks? And, and how many vendors, I don't, how many vendors probably, do you know about today that are accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment off the top of your head? Th th there's hundreds. No, no. I would, I would say that the vast majority of them do what I do. It's shift gold, right? People want to, you know, needle me. Oh, shift gold. You know, you take Bitcoin. No, we don't. There is a company that was out there, BitPay, that basically said, "Hey, work with us, and we'll help people who have Bitcoin shop at your store by buying their Bitcoin from them, selling it, getting dollars, and then giving you dollars for your products." And the vast majority of firm of companies that accept Bitcoin. Don't accept Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They work with BitPay, and they make it easier for people who have Bitcoin to sell the Bitcoin to get the currency that the re that the merchants do accept. Mm -hmm. How many other currencies do you accept on the website? We only accept in, in, in Shift Gold. We only accept dollars. Dollars and Bitcoin. No, we don't accept Bitcoin. We work through BitPay. And obviously, look, the reason that some merchants initially jumped on the bad wagon is all of a sudden a bunch of people who had Bitcoin. And they bought it when it was 10 bucks, 100 bucks. All of a sudden, it's worth five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. You now have a lot of people who have some money to spend. And so I can't blame merchants for saying, hey, you just got rich on Bitcoin. Buy some stuff at my store. We'll make it easy for you. And in fact, the store has got some free publicity. The minute you announce that you're accepting Bitcoin, all of a sudden, you got all this free publicity and people actually started shopping there. You know, So it was all part of the marketing effort to pump up the demand and, and to create the false impression that people are actually using it as a medium of exchange when they're not. Gentlemen, we are running out of time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give each of the two gentlemen here two minutes to give us a closing argument. Now, what I want here is, I think, Peter, you've had your say, and you've had your say, and we could continue going around here for hours. 
What I want to do is I want you guys to formulate a two-minute closing argument to try and convince the other side to see your point. And I want you to try and convince Peter to see that maybe there's some value yeah. in Bitcoin. Peter, I want you to try and convince Ant that there's no value in Bitcoin and that we should all be looking to the 3,000-year-old precious metal. This time, Peter, you can go first. Well, you know, I've had a lot of experience talking with uh, Bitcoiners or Bitcoin bugs. And to me, it's almost like a religion at this point. I mean, the people who believe in it are going to believe in it no matter what I say. Right? And it's like I can't convince, you know, somebody who's, uh, you know, Catholic that they should be Jewish. You know, they're just, they've been brought up on a particular religion and that's what they believe. And I, unfortunately, I think a lot of people in Bitcoin fall into that. And I think what's really clouding their judgment is their own greed. Uh, because if people are right about what's going to happen to Bitcoin, all the people who own it are going to be really rich. And that's a dream that people don't want to let go of, right? They, 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 they want that to happen. And so they build up a wall to prevent, you know, any kind of rational argument from penetrating it because they don't want that worldview disrupted. They want to believe that they can get rich, just like people wanted to believe they can get rich owning a home during the housing bubble or during the dot-com bubble. It's very powerful uh, when you combine sometimes ignorance with greed and a little bit of knowledge. I mean, I'm not saying that people in, in crypto uh, are foolish because they actually believe a lot of things in some cases that are right. But then they got sidetracked by their own greed and 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 once they get in this thing, they they can't seem to let it go. So it's it's like it's people. difficult for people to take a step back and you know when you live in a bubble, you can't see the bubble. Peter, right? your time's up. Anthony, he's saying that Bitcoin is a bubble, that we're all in it for greed and that we don't want to let it go because we're seeing the riches ahead of us. And you've got a, a big task here, and um, I think the whole crypto community now is looking to you to try and convince Peter in two minutes that it's not a bubble, and it's actually much more than that. Peter, I urge you <laughs> to have an open mind for the next two minutes. I, I know you're here to represent right. gold, but I need you to have an open mind Hallelujah, Bitcoin. Okay, for two minutes, see. because right. one million people on crypto Twitter are going to listen to this, and it all comes down to the next two minutes. <laughs> Have an open mind, and two minutes, it's over to you. Let's get this man to believe that I'm still waiting maybe. for him to give me the $100 uh, worth of Bitcoin he promised. It, Just it, found out he never even, he never even paid up. It, it, in the... Uh in the words of Satoshi, if Peter doesn't get it, I don't have time. But um, I do think that um, if Peter or others believe everything you just said, right, with 100% confidence, there is 0% chance that you could be wrong, you could be missing something, 0% uh, chance that Bitcoin could be valuable, that um, it could be a new technology, a new trend, um, that it's a 0% chance that the millions of people who are currently buying and holding this are wrong, don't buy any. Don't put it in your portfolio. Don't use it. But if there is even a 1% chance that you could be wrong, the odds, given that it is an asymmetric asset, mean that you will be kicking yourself forever for having known about this, spend all your time doing this, getting berated on the internet, and miss the opportunity. Yeah. And so if you're 100% confident that you're right and 0% uh, possible that you're wrong, keep doing what you're doing. But if you think there's even 1% chance that you could be wrong or that even if you are right theoretically in practice, something else is going to happen, then you have to get some exposure to it. See, but that argument would have, would have been correct when I first heard about Bitcoin when it was, I don't know, 10 bucks or whatever it was. I'm already kicking myself. I had that opportunity. I could already be a billionaire if I had only bought it back then. But because I made the mistake of not buying it back then, doesn't mean I'm going to compound the mistake by getting greedy and buying it now. The trade is done, right? The key now is for the people who got in early to cash out. Peter, and now they need a, a, a fresh round of bag holders. To, to, <laughs> Huh? Bitcoin billionaire Peter Schiff has a fantastic well, ring to it. I, but I, I missed my shot. I missed my chance. So, Peter, it sounds to me like the reason why you don't want to believe in Bitcoin is because you think you've missed your shot. I did miss my shot. I, the shot, I should have bought it when I first heard about it, and I could have sold it, you know, at a huge profit. But there's a lot of fundamentals that Anthony's been talking about today which mirror the fundamentals of gold. They don't. The they fact don't that mirror it's them scarce, all. The that it's easily no, 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 no. It does No, no, that part doesn't count. I, there is nothing that is currently uh, where gold is being used. There isn't a single uh, 
real world uh, use for gold, where you can substitute Bitcoin and use it instead, right? Yeah, you, uh, you, you, you can't say, oh, well, I was gonna make this necklace out of gold, but I'm gonna make it out of Bitcoin. Peter, you, we, you can't, you know, I'm, uh, you know I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make this uh, computer chip, and instead of using gold, I'm gonna stick some Bitcoin in there. It Peter, we're all running out of time here, but I, I have one question for you, and as the moderator, yeah. I shouldn't be getting involved, but I have one question for you. If Bitcoin were to go back to $100 tomorrow, would you buy it? Tomorrow it went to $100? If it went back to $100 well, in the next three months, would that be your second shot at buying Bitcoin? Well, you know, I probably wouldn't buy it, but I'm not a big trader, you know? I mean, but I mean, could I buy it at 100 and try to flip it at 500? I mean, it might be very volatile. Look, I mean, look, this is crypto trader. I mean, for, from a trading perspective, right, you could trade the hell out of crypto. Right, it's like that old joke about these sardines are for eating and these are for trading because they're rotten. Nobody would eat them, but you can still trade them. So crypto isn't good money. Right? You can't use it as money. It's not a store of value. Peter, but you can trade on, the hell out of it. We could go on forever, <laughs> but unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today for this golden debate. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, we've had a lot of a great time here in the studio. Let us know on Twitter who you think came out tops in the debate and whether you think that we can convert Peter Schiff well, to become Well, that's going to be rigged because uh, the Bitcoin only people bugs. watching, the only people watching are the crypto, are the crypto bugs. But why not bugs. send it down to gold <laughs> Twitter? I mean, is there no gold Twitter? Is there no nah, Twitter because we're not a cult gold? like that, you know. <laughs> I'll see you all again next week. Until then, I'll be on Twitter at Crypto Man Run. And you, if you're going to trade, trade well, my friends. <laughs>